Hi, I'm Patrick. And I'm Lev. And this is the Mach-E Vlog. We've spent the past few days in this beautiful Lexus RZ450E. We're gonna tell you all about it today. So let's go. Okay, I'm gonna start with the front of the car. This could be a little bit controversial. I mean, some people love it, some people hate it. Uh, partially, I think it's because of this big front snaz uh, on a lot of the Lexuses. They have that like big giant grill. There's no grill here, but it has a little bit of accents that remind you of a grill, but then it just still has that big front area there. Very angular. Um, a lot of people don't like the two-tone colors or the cladding. I think it all plays together very well, very well in person. When I saw photos and other videos, I wasn't quite so sure, but you know, seeing it now, I'm like, it, it looks pretty good uh, overall. And driving it around for the past week, I've gotten so that I really like the look of it. Plus just some of the design elements. Like if you look at it individually, like the two-tone paint might not appeal to you or whatever, but like when it comes together, like some of the angles here with the nose, with the two-tone paint, especially this blue-gray metallic paint, um, and then tying it in with the wheels down here, it just sort of all comes together when you see it in person. I think it looks uh, a bit angular and aggressive and high tech because of the, the colors that are picked here and the two-tone nature of it. Um, a lot of people really don't like the two-tone, but um, I think if you look at it in person, it sort of like pulls everything together and looks pretty sharp. Now looking at the side profile of the RZ450, it's pretty much just like a lot of other compact crossover SUVs. Uh, it swoops down toward the rear of the vehicle instead of like coming and having a more boxy shape. Looks, uh, you know, more aerodynamic and it is more aerodynamic by doing that. One of the things that's a little bit unique is that of course this part here being black and then the other, you know, body paint here creates sort of like a different look and I believe makes it look a little bit sleeker and thinner than if it were all like body color. So pulls that together pretty fairly well. Um, some of the like curves and stuff that you can see a little bit on camera right here, give it a, a, a basically a lot of character on the side so that it doesn't look just like a big flat, you know, surface. And then as with a lot of other crossover compact SUVs, they sort of use some black down low to make it look a little bit skinnier so that it isn't, again, a big fat piece of metal from the side. One of the things that's really neat, of course, is this looks like it's a complete spoiler up here at the top, but I can put my hand behind it. It's actually, it's almost like, uh, I've heard them called like cat ears because it just swoops back here. Helps direct some of the air, but because there's no rear windshield wiper, wiper on the back, be, with that coming down at the angle that it does, uh, apparently helps keep some of the water off and the dirt and debris. So you don't necessarily need that rear windshield wiper. And um, the other element that I'll point out is some of the aggressive looking uh, lights that are in front, the headlights is also continued back here. Uh, very nice angles, some sharp corners here and brings just a, a fair amount of interest into like what could normally be just like a dull, you know, regular old brake light. I, I sort of like the way uh, that all looks in the, the back part, but overall, it, I think it has a relatively sleek look with a lot of little interesting elements, all of the little uh, curves, the creases, and the little black accents basically give it a lot of interest. If it's not to your styling, you probably already stopped and watched this video, but let's go and take a look at the very back. So now this is a better angle. The one in the middle, that's a what they call a shark fin antenna. That's basically providing you your satellite radio reception 
and FM radio, I believe, through through those. But you can get a better look at how the like aerodynamics are have been put into the rear of this and the little cat ears as as I've heard them referred to. Um, it looks sort of awkward, but you know, from the side it gives it that that spoiler look and looks pretty good. And then back here, it isn't really a spoiler, but because of the way that it's flared up and it on the top here is black, gives it the look of a having a spoiler. And with all of these compact uh, SUV crossovers, the butt always looks quite thick. And this was no exception. And that's offset a little bit. You can't really see it in that camera view, but down here is the bottom half is black. So that makes, again, makes it look a little bit thinner. Uh, very nice to see, you know, Lexus here, uh, RZ450, Direct 4, which is just talking about their all-wheel drive system. Just, you know, typical badging that you will see on other Lexuses that keep the brand consistent. And again, you know, I'm liking that the, the light accent, there's a little bit of red that goes all the way across. Um, and let's see, I'm going to adjust this. It's not really the best way to see it, but you can see down here, it's like fake uh, ventilation coming down through the, the the rear of the vehicle and gives it just sort of like a futuristic, like, I guess like aeronautic look, if you ask me. Now let's talk about some basic stats of the car. So the biggest one, the biggest like red flag for people, if you're looking for a long range EV, is that the range on this one, this is the luxury model with the bigger wheels, is only 196 miles. That might be a red flag and a showstopper for you. But if you're only gonna use this around town, that's more than fine. If you're gonna only do the occasional road trip, you still might be okay. So, you know, like one of the things I point out is like from here to Vegas, it's probably about 300 miles. So you'll probably have like one, maybe two stops. Um, this one might take you just a little bit longer. Uh, if you have to do it like once a month, it might become a very big pain, a big chore to take uh, a, an EV like this. You may wanna look at something else. But if you're doing that maybe twice a year, don't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. If you live in cold climates, that 196 miles will probably drop significantly. So that might be another consideration. So if ranges is a, is a, a big importance factor for you, that might be an issue. Now this shares a lot of the underpinnings that the BZ4X from Toyota and the Subaru Solterra. So they share a lot of the same components, but this one actually has a, I believe a bigger front motor um, same size rear motor, I may have got that mixed up, but it does produce just over 300 horsepower, means it does zero to 60 at about 5.1 seconds. So it is more powerful than either the BZ4X or the Solterra. So if that's something that you're looking for, that's uh, what you can find in this, this, this uh, RZ450E. The charging, it will peak at 150, but the biggest issue with that if you get into the actual charging curve is like it will, you know, only hit about 150 or if you're lucky under perfect conditions, but then it drifts down and gets a lot slower. And then above 80%, it gets significantly slower. So those are all things that we, you know, look at when we're looking at EVs. And if those are big factors for you, that might be something that, you know, prevents you from buying this vehicle. But there are a lot of reasons that this is still a good EV, depending on your use cases. Getting into this cabin, you can see that everything is quite driver focused. It's all tilted towards the driver. We have a pretty large center console here that in my case is a little bit too invasive for my left leg driving, but it's not super bad. We do have a front and back cup holder. I am partial to the side by side, but it's nice that these ones have pretty good grabbies and they've held on to my really tall water bottle really well. The spinnable gear shifter is really fun. I like it, similar to the Maki, really, but um, Patrick uh, likes to fiddle with stuff while he drives, so we have noticed that he fiddles with this, which is not great. <laughs> well, I, I pushed, and then that puts it in neutral <laughs> while I was at a stoplight, and then you have to go to park, I think, first before you can go back into gear, but you, you literally like push this part down. I'm gonna put it in neutral. Um, I think that did not do it. You push and twist, basically. Anyways, so it has to be quite intentional. My foot isn't on the brake, so probably nothing's gonna happen. But a lot of your controls are around here. Uh, Patrick's gonna go into the multimedia, but something I do wanna point out is that the camera control is there. It is nice that the camera is there, but I keep forgetting because I expect it to be on the screen up somewhere. Here, yeah, or something like that. So every time I'm about to pull in somewhere, I'm like, uh, uh. 
Um, we have three USB-C, which is great. This is plugged in right now, and we have the wireless charging pad down there, which seems a little sensitive. I'm not super sure why, but... Um, and it makes like a noise, like a little buzzing noise if you're not exactly on it. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm not sure what that is, but it, it does work. It does work well. It does work, and it's still nice and easy to have something where you can just fling your phone. And I'm partial to ones where you can see your phone. So if anything pops up and you're not connected to the car, uh, you can tell your screen brightens. So onto the materials, if you're looking down here, this is all a sustainable interior. This is faux wood. It's not real wood. It's beautifully etched to emulate some kind of ash. I'm not really sure what it is. I wonder if it's an actual thing that exists, but it looks pretty gorgeous to me and the texture feels lovely. And um, we also have this brushed metal, which is, it's plastic, but I'm partial to brush finishes. They're easier to keep clean. We know like the piano black like this is a little more fingerprinty. That's not too bad. Not too bad, but it scratches easy after a few years. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there is some piano black over on the dash a little bit, but yeah. not a ton, um, not compared to some other cars. Uh, and there's a little bit up here. And before we go too far, let's just do this because I think it's so cool. Yeah, since we're up here, let's hop over to one of the really cool features of this interior. And that is a little boop of a button. <laughs> I think that's so cool. <laughs> the roof is no longer opaque. We have electrochromic gloss on the roof here. The roof is partitioned, so the front and the back are separate, but they both experience the electrochromic effect. Here. And there is no lag, so if you're showing the front and back, they both go instantly the same way. It's so cool. Very cool. And if you look at me, I think you can tell the difference. Can you tell the difference? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I feel like now I would need sunblock on, but... And it's a mostly it activated, not so cloudy much. day, uh, partially cloudy. So you, when it's in the bright sun, it's even more... It's even more noticeable. More noticeable, yeah. So while you're in this direction, let's look at some of the textiles. This is faux leather. It actually looks pretty good in leather. The material around the steering wheel is also technically faux leather, but it feels a bit like a neoprene to me. On the side of the doors, we have plush micro suede, not real suede. This I really love, and it feels good on your skin when you're accidentally sort of brushing your elbow against the door. It feels lovely. Now point up here. This is one thing that's been bugging me, and you can even see uh, we didn't do that. Someone else has stained that material just a little. This white headliner trim up here is not something I'm a fan of. It's a cloth. It's not the easiest to clean, I imagine. So if you're like me and you wear makeup, then you're going to be brushing makeup-y fingers or you want to reapply some lipstick, and you're doing this while you're touching a light fabric that is not super easy or super um, protected against smudges and smears so i'm not a huge fan of that but the rest of the interior is gorgeous and plush and now if you look in front of patrick you may notice the complete lack of a glove box but <laughs> underneath this material here is a heating element there's also one underneath the steering wheel so if you go over here you'll see like the little icon there when you turn on the heated seats i'm not going to do it because i'm warm <laughs> on both sides it will basically turn on the heated seats as well as the heating element here and the idea is being an electric vehicle it could be more efficient to just run those at, to you know heat your body and your knees up um, versus you know running the fan in the whole hvac system um, to try to heat up the entire cabin because that's a that's a lot of air all the way back there to try to heat up um we did not run it much. We I did. did we did turn mistake. it on. Yeah, we turned it on to, <laughs> just to see how it is. Very effective. Very effective. Yeah, it's funny because even my mom said it was effective when she was sitting in the back seats. I don't think it was doing anything I, in the back seats. Again. I don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, it does have a heating steer, steering wheel. And uh, on both sides, you can see in the front, there are ventilated seats. So very nice to see. Uh, that's something that I wish that we had in our car. Um, everything else is fairly straightforward. I, I wasn't going to go into the entertainment system. Uh, I'll just say it's not bad. Oh, you're adjusting things over there. I am. I just, uh, <laughs> cause I was looking at the steering wheel. Something that I love is that this is once again, brush metal, these controls here, 
They are not haptic or anything, but they're very tangible buttons. And when I'm swiping my finger here, I'm adjusting between the modes of the vehicle. So I'm gonna go pop back into normal. But something that is extremely cool about this is that as I'm just swiping my thumb on the heads up display, can yeah, you it? can see it. Let's, I'm gonna hit zoom in quick. There you go. On the heads up display, you can see that I'm swiping. Sorry for the flickering, but- It, it doesn't flicker like that for the human eye. It does not. There it looks go. great for the human eye. Uh, so you can see that I'm just resting my finger on eco mode and it'll say eco mode. And there are different things within these controls on the steering wheel that will pop up when you swipe on them and then you can select them. Like and then I hit the button below, the, mm -hmm. the page button below. Nope, the, not that one, the page button. Oh. And then that's switched over to the driver assistance functions. So it's like you can cycle through what that uh, little keypad does or D-pad. I very, wish you could see deep. it as clearly as we can I see know. it because it's a really nice heads up display, honestly. Okay. So going back over here, uh, whoop, we're really zoomed in. Let's go back out. So yeah, it's uh, one of the neat little features is the, the temperature thing. It has like a little screen in here that's showing you the, the temperature that you're at. Uh, otherwise, uh, fairly straightforward and normal like uh, software here. It isn't the best, the, uh, the navigation. This is because it's trying to connect my Lexus account, which I don't actually really have. Um, navigation seems pretty good. It has the um, thing, if you call out the name of the brand, <laughs> it will uh, do navigation, it does voice commands. AKA um, voice activated navigation. Has a uh, Sirius XM radio. We're connected to CarPlay now. So I can go over here and then there we are, we're in CarPlay. Um, the only thing, and this is, this is like, not the only thing, but one of the quirks that I don't like is once you get into the CarPlay screen, it's not very easy to get back over to the cars system. So the way you have to do it is you have to hit the icons here, and then I have the Lexus app installed, so I would tap that. But sometimes what happens is, is like I'm on this screen, and then I go over here, and it'll come back to like a different set of icons, and then I gotta find where the, le the, the Lexus button is. I don't wanna trigger the voice command thing. But, uh, when I tap that, now I'm back over into the car's native stuff. So again, like if I'm here, um, like in maps, then I have to like go and find it to get back over. So a little, little bit quirky, but uh, you know, I got used to it, but it, it, you know, sometimes it was like three or four taps to like get to where I needed to, to get back over to this. And, and sometimes I swap, uh, swap back and forth between like CarPlay nav and the native nav, just because you know, sometimes no coverage in CarPlay, for example, with my phone. But anyways, the door handles were very confusing for the first time I got out because I was like, you got to pull it and there's like a little red thing here. It's like pull twice. So that's like the, the emergency release. But then I just figured out you literally just push your thumb and the door opens. And it's really, really like intuitive. Like you, that's exactly where I would grab if I were going to grab this handle, push it and it's open. So I like the interior door handles, um, but that was confusing for everybody that sat in the car, so. But on that note, I think that most vehicles are confusing in their doors <laughs> when you first use them. I do think that ergonomically, this is a fantastic way to do it because you don't need a great deal of uh, control, force, or dexterity to be able to open the door. There is a texture on the spot where your thumb touches and it is naturally where your thumb lies. So multiple times my mom or my dad or other people were in the vehicle were um, going like this to the door handle and saying, how do you open it? And I said, just pinch your thumb, press where your thumb is, and then it automatically opens. Ergonomically, fantastic. Now, one place in which this door <laughs> has been consistently difficult is in the closing. It is harder to close it gently. Every single person who got into this vehicle did not close the door properly. On the first try. On the first try and always had to slam it again. And then my mom and I got into my sister's car and my mom slammed the door and my sister was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And my mom's like, I'm sorry because of this. So she'd like 
been trained now to close it harder and she didn't need to in that vehicle. And so it, that's open and noticeable. close yours because it, it feels solid when you do it. Like, and I think that's oh, part of yeah. the car being solid to listen. Like it clunk. It's, it's super a, solid. It feels yeah. solid. So I like it, but it does, it took everybody. Like, I think your mom, like every single time we had every to say, time. Can, you, yeah. can you close the door again? Yeah. So that was a thing. Um, I do have to show you one of my favorite things in this cabin is right over here. So we have a huge storage space. This is also really cushy and nice to lean your arms on. But you want to get inside the storage, not to worry. You pop inside. We've got a whole bunch of GoPros in there. Now, I want to get inside. Oh, my gosh. How cool is that that we have a double-sided cubby space here absolutely love it there's no way to open it in this direction um upwards long ways whatever only side by side but that's perfectly fine super awesome and looking at some more storage space right underneath this center cubby there's a pretty good space unfortunately it's a little closed off by the seat here so your access to this gap is not as big as you'd like it but it is a good space and i think you'll notice that on the driver's side the lip is greater and that is to stop any bags or things from falling out into the driver's footwell which is really considerate and cool yeah i i had trouble like putting stuff in from the driver's side and i didn't realize this side is a lot more open but that's that's a pretty neat idea uh it still is a little bit hard to get things in and out that are any de decent size but um you know i think on our cart we have like a tissue box and it would be a very small tissue box to actually fit in this one but i like having that type of storage and that's the type of thing that you can do on evs yeah absolutely since you're facing me my final input is on the seats if you're curious they're extremely comfortable they are extremely comfortable there's a whole ton of different support features lumbar um you can raise it and lower it can't you raise lower it's yeah. very good control the lumbar is excellent it actually isn't just uh you know like sometimes lumbar goes out that much it just it a seems lot. like it goes out a lot yeah and we have three memory settings they're on the left of the steering wheel so you can't really see them but you know what they look like little buttons you can set uh record your memory i'm number one uh so it remembers everything about your seating um and it's really really comfortable if you were curious cushy and the final thing before I, I hop out, since we covered almost everything, is looking at the screen here, you can see what I was talking about. There is not a percentage mark showing exactly how much uh, battery you have left. It's sort of like just like an old fashioned fuel gauge. It does show you uh, on the left side, there's like a power meter that if we were driving, it shows like how much, uh, you know, Electricity is being applied to the motors to propel you. And then, you know, when you're in a braking situation and using regenerative braking, it'll show you like the negative going in uh, for braking as well. But, but yeah, sort of a little bit of lack of info as far as battery percentage, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward um, instrument cluster. Let's go check out the back seats. Okay, first of all, let me try closing the door sort of firmly, but not slamming it. Like, I probably would slam it more than that, but my mother-in-law had a trouble with that. And of course, I can look back, look up there and I can see that it says the door's not fully closed. So you have to, feels like you're slamming it to get it to close properly. But um, good amount of leg room here. We got like a little seat pocket in front of us. It's very soft materials here, no plastic or anything like that. Um, but I do have to say, it's like, it feels like my feet are up high so like my knees are you know up off the edge of the seat right here um, if you have very long legs you may have the the room but it's like you're going to be in a little bit of a, a fetal position as you're sitting in the the back seats i do like how it feels this uh, faux suede feels very nice all the way across the back seat um, one of the things to note it looks like it may have a pass through here. It does not. There's no pass through to the rear storage area, but there are two cup holders here. We have a couple of more uh, USB-C ports here, and we do have seat warmers in the back. I didn't realize that. And we have vents for the back. So rear seat seat warmers. Again, that's one of the things that may justify a little bit more cost in this vehicle and could help out with the fact that there's a lower range. And there is a 12 volt back here. So I know there's one in the rear uh, storage area as well, but 
Yeah. One thing to, that I've noticed sitting back here is that this bar here sort of breaks up the expanse of the glass roof versus a lot of other EVs or just cars that have a glass roof that goes all the way front to back. It looks like you're just looking up into the great expanse of the sky. Here with the bar, it feels like there's like a little portal here and one up there. So it interrupts the flow of things a little bit, um, but it's still letting in a lot, a lot of light. So uh, just something to take note of. Sometimes in vehicles, it feels like you have to be really precise in where you press to open the trunk. This actually feels really good. Like the button area is quite large. You can see as this goes up, there's a large area of space for me to press to open it up. And uh, once this is open, this trunk is great. It fits the wheelchair perfectly with no issues. This is a hard cover. Uh, and when you take it down, which I'm not going to right now, but as you can see, it folds in the middle. It comes down pretty easily, but this all folds into one side. So you have to store that somewhere like underneath. But fortunately, there's quite a good chunk of space under here. And you got and my jacket. You got your jacket <laughs> caught. Um, the trunk is well appointed and nice and spacious, which is great because there is no frunk. So. And, <laughs> and then I think this is the thing I was saying. There's a 12 volt over here and it says max four kilograms on these hooks here. There's a hook on both sides. A um, Couple of tie downs here, fairly straightforward. And then if you did hear the car was like beeping and stuff, I'm like, why are you beeping? I got the key here. I don't know what you're beeping for. This car beeps a lot. <laughs> it does. Do you not know what it's beeping for? Half the time we don't know what it's beeping yeah, for. Yeah, I right? don't know. All right, that I think it's obvious. time to get on the road. I'm gonna drive a little, let's go. So we were just talking about the fact that I'm trying to get used to using a heads up display as navigation instead of talking. <laughs> yeah, we, she likes having Apple play, um, speak the instructions. I don't, and I'm even without the heads up display, like in our car, I just see it on the, the center screen and I'm good with that. Um, but you know, it depends on your preference. I think the heads up display, it's been pretty useful. It has been. I mean, we don't have one in the Maki, -E and it's not something I'm super used to, but I think that this would happen quite easily. Um, is this right, Tone? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's a very, very far back, like, entrance to yeah, the Yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I'd like to get some more experience with heads-up displays, because it almost feels like this one's a little high, doesn't it? Or it did not me? seem that way until you mentioned it, and mm. I thought it did. Yeah. Um, I really, really do like the feature though, and especially if we're going to start getting away from instrument clusters and vehicles. Hopefully not. Yeah, hopefully not, but heads up displays are cool. As far as the ride quality, I really like this a lot. Like it feels a lot smaller also than it is, because it's not that much smaller than the mach -E, is it? Very similar in size to the mach -E overall. Um, I, I do think it's a bit like a bit bouncy which the like select and premium mach -E's can feel a bit bouncy as well but it, overall it's it's like smooth and bouncy if that makes sense it's not like there if a the ride is firm and bouncy it's like jarring this yeah. is just a little bit like it's bouncy. definitely smooth and bouncy and i don't know how noticeable the bouncy would have been if we hadn't had passengers a lot so uh, we actually had family visiting this whole time that we've had the the lexus and we had my mom and my dad in the back and they're older so if anything's wrong with the ride you hear about it very quickly so we heard that it's bouncy they had a lot of opinions <laughs> about the car but, a lot of opinions um, some of it was just that they weren't familiar with the car but Overall, I think everybody that's been in it has uh, liked, you know, how it feels, um, you know, luxurious wise, very nice seats, um, fake suede or vegan mm. suede, we'll say, we won't say fake. And uh, vegan or not even vegan, like fake, what, what do we call this? Non-animal free leather steering wheel, which feels a little bit like neoprene, like it almost feels like one of those uh covers that you get for your ipad or something it's kind of squishy i don't mind it though it definitely doesn't feel or look leathery though maybe on the dash more so it's well it's this is all like soft plastic um this is not quite as soft but then the the suede on the doors um, the seats it, it all feels fairly nice and then uh even like the fake wood green um i think it's fake 
right? <laughs> but it, it it all feels like very good quality materials. I, I, I like the, yeah. That, that's like the biggest thing that I've noticed is um, the quality of the materials. And if you hear any rattles, it's not the car. We do have, a, you know, filming gear and cables and yeah. uh, the key. But obviously we did a walkabout of the vehicle and we told you all about it. This is very much about driving impressions. So if you know me, you know that I am an amputee. I'm a right leg amputee. I drive with my left leg crossed over, which I'm doing right now. Not super sure how much you can see, but there's a big console right here on um, the center console and I'm pushing quite hard against it with my knee. Not super great. If you are that really rare case like me and you drive with your left leg, then you might experience this too, but it's a little tight for me. Um, if you like a little bit more spacious of a footwell, whatever, this is not it. I mean, it's not, it's certainly not tight. Like some vehicles are, um, what do you call them? Like cockpit cabins? Yeah, it's yeah. definitely not like uh, the Audi, the Audi RS, e totally what I was thinking. which is totally a cockpit or the Taycan. Yeah, but, uh, or it, even the Polestar, it's not that bad, but yeah. it's invasive, unfortunately. Uh, regarding the pedal feel, it's lovely. Uh, it feels quite like an ice vehicle. You can coast really well. The controls are on the paddles under the steering wheel. There's no full on one pedal and Patrick and I are completely opposite each other in regards to one pedal usage. So I turn it all the way off, which is pressing the right all the way and he turns it all the way on. The okay. benefit for me is that it defaults to off. So when you start the car, it's ready for me, right? <laughs> yeah, and you do have uh, different driving modes. So there's like normal, sport, um, sport has a little bit more region by default. Normal is normal. Then there's an eco, which uh, what that does is like limits the throttle response a little bit as well as limits the AC. And then there's a range. And That's how do you noticeable. gonna bother range because no. uh, it completely turns off the AC or heat and limits you to like 62 miles per hour, 100 kilometers per hour so we we're like we don't want to touch that and right now we're in eco um i'm quite comfortable in eco personally it's wow a really tight turn here <laughs> oh let's feel the turning oh so patrick thinks it feels a little top heavy i can see what you mean compared to see what you mean it has a lot of you know the battery weight at the bottom like most yeah. evs but i think because we're sitting up a little bit higher it shifts that feeling of low center of gravity up just a bit yeah so on that like that was basically like a, a switch back at 45 miles an hour i felt that a little uh but not too bad i certainly don't think that this would be a play car up in the mountains but for what we're using it for patrick is navigating to some random spot um for what we're using it for this is lovely, which is driving in the city. The suspension feels really great. There are numer numerous bumps and potholes. We've been doing this road a lot for testing vehicles and it's not the best. But with this vehicle, the it road. actually feels great, huh? The road's not the best. The road's not the best. The car is good. I... We'll just turn right here. Right, thank you. I, I give it a... I give a... I, I think... I just think the suspension is really nice. It's really good. Well, you know, it, it, as always, good. it's depending on um, what you're looking for. If you're looking for a sporty, quick drive, I don't think this is it. If you're looking for something um, fairly plush, uh, this is getting there. It's not like a Mercedes EQS that we tested out with the air suspension. Um, Do I want the left lane? Um, probably middle. Okay. Yeah, I think plush is a great way to describe it. And uh, it's not the most amazing luxury thing it's not the mercedes it's not super sporty but it's really really comfortable and this has been enjoyable to drive around the city and it feel, you, you mentioned it feels like an ice yeah. car and it really does it feels ice it's uh fairly quick though but not super quick um the throttle response you roll into the acceleration so it feels um i think a lot of people could adapt to this and yes. then like the just the overall like the the controls and everything feel fairly close to like if this were just a regular Lexus. 
Yes, agreed. And so Patrick and I look for different things in our vehicles. For example, I drove the Sherry Bolt, Sherry, the Cherry Bolt, the Chevy Bolt recently. And for me, that's perfect. It feels like an ICE vehicle. It's very unthreatening. This feels like an upgraded version of that, a little more luxury version. It's very comfortable. It's very smooth. It's very unthreatening. It feels like a car. <laughs> you don't really focus too much on whether it's electric or not. And um, like Patrick was saying, the cabin feels unthreatening. Like it feels just well appointed and nothing's too overtly like techy. Um, perhaps the heads up display, but oh, uh, well, of course the roof, that's like the roof is above cool. and beyond. And yeah. It keeps on asking for the pin and that's because I have the Lexus app installed, but I don't have it connected to the car. <laughs> Uh, because we're not authorized. This is a loaner vehicle. But of uh, course, we try to do all the things that we can do. So. Yeah, I, I was trying. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, like when we were having, for me, the in-laws hop in the car, her mom and her dad, they weren't like, oh my gosh, this is like a space vehicle or some like robot vehicle. They, I think they just treated fairly much like, yeah, I'm just riding in a, a regular car. It wasn't like overwhelming with the luxury or the tech they did you know everybody did comment on the seats i think the seats are nice and i'm looking at the back yes. the back seats are nice the the door handles from the outside pretty much normal my and, dad liked that um he finds the maki a little confusing i think for, uh, yeah. everybody does yeah uh, and consistently people have liked the way it looks on the outside, even my nephews. So we had this cool experience of having an entire age range of people see this. So my 15 year old nephew and then my 70 something year old parents were like, oh, nice. And funnily enough, my mom, who's been in the Maquis multiple times, she was like, um, what did she say about it? As though it was the Maquis, do you remember? Well, your mom wasn't really paying attention. She wasn't paying attention, <laughs> but it wasn't so different in mm -hmm. a way. Like it feels like the same class of vehicle. Yeah. 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 It's it, it's really interesting seeing different people's perspectives on things, and uh, like we really like the roof. You can't really tell here, but um, oh wow, Ooh. <laughs> that's actually every time. Cool. Every time it's surprising. So the, the and this is one of the the luxury things. I think it's just so cool because it's bright and sunny, and we don't want to film, so we can mm -hmm. do the electrochromatic or electrochromatic electro uh, tint. So it basically goes yeah. Um, it doesn't like darken as in shift to gray or black. It's just like a really uh, more opaque white. Heavily frosted. Heavily yeah. frosted. That's perfect. And uh, I think it's actually great on a day like this where I wouldn't want the sun coming right in at my eyes. We can flip that. And, uh, you know, I, I this is the first vehicle I've been in that's had it. I've seen it um, like on the Taycan and some other higher end vehicles. So it's really cool that it is now becoming available. And that's, those are the little things like, I, you know, we'll get into it a little bit um, throughout the video about the, the pricing of this. And in some ways it could appear to be overpriced, but it also has some features that justify that, that expense. Like the roof, I think is very, very cool. It's super, super cool. And you might wonder, is it gimmicky or whatever? Uh, no, I don't think it is. Because, so the mach -E, the glass roof is heavily tinted, right? So it's not heavily tinted in the sense that you can't see out. It's heavily tinted in the sense that you're not getting UV rays. You're very comfortable. This glass roof by itself is bright. It feels bright. It feels like you're getting all the sun coming on in here and um, you're getting the full effect of the sun. So the photochromic, electrochromic, which word is it? Electrochromic? I, I think it's electro. <laughs> electrochromic is actually doing its job effectively and completely blocking out the sun, but then you get the full benefit of a glass roof, which is just so cool. Although it's interesting, you can see it in this view that there's a bar in the middle. Um, a lot of the other glass roofs are just like, you know, from the front to the rear, and that bar across the middle isn't that big of a deal for us in the front seats, but in the back seats, you lose a bit of the the nice big glass roof feeling. You and do. I wonder if that's because they do the the uh, electrochromatic. Uh, I want to say that electrochromic, <laughs> electrochromic uh, uh, tinting and untinting. 
because the bigger that stuff is, the more expensive it is. So maybe like two smaller panels is way easier. It could very well be. And another weird thing about the electrochromic, let's hope that's the right word, is that it's built quite well into this. So it, it tends, it's like a frosted white, right? It's very effective, but it does it in a way that's not shocking. So we kept trying to show it to people, like the older generation, and they were like, huh. Yeah, and they didn't realize quite how cool it was. And I think that if it tinted black or something, you'd be like, oh, whoa, right? I, <laughs> I was, I, that was me. Whoa. Whoa, so cool. that was me like, too. Like I keep doing it, watch it. Ah. Whoa, that's really bright. It makes me want sunglasses. It's pretty, I just think it's so <laughs> neat. So what do you it's guys think neat. about that? Is that like something that you want now that more people are doing glass roofs or do you just want to do like a, a steel roof with maybe a sunroof? Steel roof, Steel weird. Roof. Uh, Stupid thing, I gotta go back. <laughs> but uh, we're getting into faster roads here. You're probably interested in how this thing drives on the highway, how old it, all of the ADAS stuff is. Patrick is gonna demonstrate a lot of that. So we should probably switch and you should take over and do some, some fun driving. Okay. Okay. Okay, yeah. my driving impressions. It can zip away from a stoplight very easily and get up to the speed limit quickly. So I like that. Uh, yeah. So my initial driving impressions have, you know, we've had it for three or four days and they've changed over time. Um, and I think that's because like, I tend to look for like the Mach-E style, a bit more aggressive driving and suspension. And this is not either of those. So it feels a bit odd to me, but then, you know, as I get settled into it, it's actually, you know, a pretty nice driving vehicle. Um, it does feel a bit more top heavy than other EVs that we've been in. And I think that's a little bit, whoops, because of the, it is a slightly higher uh, ride height, but the battery is still below us. So it's still um, pretty nice. But I think also what gives it a little bit of that top heavy is that there's a little bit more body roll as we're going through some of these curves. And um, I think that's just because it's suspension is a little bit softer. It's not that firm suspension that's in like the EV6 or the Mach-E, specifically the Mach-E GT, which is pretty firm, but it going over like railroad tracks, I'm like, I like, I really like how this handles it. It um, does dampen it down pretty well so that you do get a little bit of the bounce, but it softens it out and does it just keep bouncing. So, uh, so far, um, I'm liking the drive and I think a lot of people will like this. Like if you're more into a comfortable Lexus type driving style, this would be great. Yeah, it's interesting you saying that because it really is kind of an excellent car for that, just a, a comfortable drive. And there aren't many railroad tracks where we live because we've been visiting family and going back and forth. They live across the, the 101 where the coaster is. So you go back and forth on the tracks. It is noticeably really nice and it's really comfortable. And even just sitting back here, like Patrick's gunning it, I feel quite relaxed because <laughs> the seats are really comfortable. Like this is high level comfort in the seats. And I feel like they'd be really good on a road trip, which is where it makes me sad because the range wouldn't be great on a road trip. I mean, you could do it. You could do it just fine, but you'd be charging every 150 miles. Yeah. It, two, 200 and something, you know? It's a big enough difference that it would be a bit more frustrating. And we didn't do a full charging test. We just charged uh, a little bit last night just to sort of see how it is. And it started off fairly well. It was like at 140 kilowatts, but then it just, you know, like the Mach-E will hold for a bit and then it steps down, holds that for a bit and then steps down. This sort of just like drifted slower and slower um, almost immediately. Like it, it ramped up to 140 and it was like drifting slower and slower as we got deeper. We got seven good minutes. Yeah. Yeah, it was seven good minutes um, above 130, I think. And then it, then it went down. And it was, it'll continue to go down. There's other videos where they do the full charging test and it goes slow and then it gets extremely slow above 80%. And in other EVs, they don't slow down quite as much before 80%. And then, uh, cause I think this one was doing like 39 kilowatts at 70%, which is not great. 
Um, the Mach-E is generally around 80 kilowatts then, usually, maybe slightly higher at, at 70%. And then at um, 80%, this will drop down to where it's almost uh, equivalent to just plugging into a level two charger so that like the last 80% can take over well over an hour to get to 100% if you need to do that, uh, which most of the time you're going to not going to do that at a, at a DC fast charger. But when the range is 196 miles, there's going to be more often where you're going to need to do that to get to a certain charger charging station. So you'd actually probably stop every 100 miles. Yeah. Which is... Uh something to consider that's definitely something to consider like you know if you could handle that i don't actually think that i could having to stop every hundred miles i it's a bit it, longer. it changes things quite a bit yeah and i was just looking it up today for another reason but like green river utah to salina utah is 107 miles so that's that's pretty much all you got and and granted whether we're in the maki or this we're going to probably make that stop but like in the maki we have the option of like skipping Salina and going to Richfield, um, and you can't probably can't do that with this car or yeah. that, you know. So uh, because you lose, you're basically losing that top twenty percent in this car. So it's it's uh, you know the the big you know thing that we don't necessarily want to harp on too much because if you're using this as a local commuter, the car is fine. If you're doing a road trip. This probably isn't the best option for you or lots of road trips, um, but you know your use case and we don't need to, to harp on that too much. Yeah. Otherwise, this is great. Like, and for commuting, I'll go ahead and turn on the adaptive cruise control. Uh, this is not like a pre map road or anything. It's a hands-on system. It has the, the sensors that are monitoring my eyes, my hands on the steering wheel, but it's actually steering for me. It won't stop at red lights but it will stop if a car in front of me stops. Uh, I find it to be a, a pretty competent system. The only area where it was a bit of an issue, and I'm gonna go ahead and hit break here, um, because it will stop for this car, but it usually stops a little bit later than what I want. Uh, the, only, the only issue that I've run into, and a lot of these systems that are basically lane centering systems, uh, have is when you're going on the freeway and you're in the right lane or the slow lane and there's an exit, an off-ramp or an on-ramp and the road like widens up or whatever, it tends to like follow the center of that. And then all of a sudden it realizes, oh, that's not where I want to be over to the left. And then it readjusts. So it feels disconcerting, disconcerting to the, uh, the passenger as well as the driver a little bit. Um, but there are some, some features that I really do like about this. And the next time we you know, get up to speed, uh, I'll show you some of that. But um, otherwise, it, it's, see, it's still asking for the pin. But. So we actually uh, had dinner last night with some friends that we made through EV stuff. And uh, Kevin, he owns a Maki. You may have seen us in one of our Maki meetups in, in Vegas and they still have a, a hybrid. And they were talking about how they road trip with the hybrid and his mach -E is what he runs around Vegas in. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are doing that, right? Like you're, you're, if you're a two car family, um, which is not crazy if you have a family and you're two adults and you have kids, whatever. So if you're a two car family, having one, an electric car for the city, and then you have your ICE vehicle or your hybrid, for road trips because as the whole charging thing shakes out, it's gonna get easier and easier, but it's definitely challenging. Like we can't deny that it's, there are things to consider. Obviously we road trip just fine, but the things to consider. So you may want an EV just for city driving, in which case anything that we say about the range is inconsequential, it's totally fine. So if we're not thinking about the range of this vehicle, I actually really like it. It feels small, but it's actually not tiny. So if you want one way or the other, you're kind of in the middle, which is great. It's nimble enough. It's comfortable and cushy and the seats are great. It's pricey. That's it's, the thing. It's a bit pricey, but it's pricey. You know, has some you know very nice feeling interior components, the roof, the stereo system sounds fantastic. Mm. Um, so it gets to that point of where like you see what you're paying for 
and it's up to you to decide if that's something that you care about. Like the, the soft touch plastic, is that nice um, for you or do you not care? The other, the other thing where I think, you know, your money's going towards is it is a very solid vehicle. It's like very quiet driving down the road. Yes. Even the motors for like the, the windows and the windshield wipers, pretty darn quiet. So, you know, you can see some of those advantages. And going back to the, the ADAS system, I'm gonna turn it on. And uh, one of the things I like, it's like uh, some other systems where if I wanna change lanes, I turn on the blinker, it turns, on, turns it off. When I turn the blinker off, it says, okay, I'm gonna take back it resume doing the lane centering. So uh, one of my pet peeves are the systems where you're in one lane, you turn your blinker on, you get to the next lane, and then you have to reactivate the system. This does automatic reactivation. Love that. The other thing is, is like if, you know, there's a little bit of like a, a pothole or debris in the road and I want to go within my lane, but go around it, I can sort of steer around it. Um, and then the, like here, well, did you see that? We wobbled a bit. That's one of the things I was talking about. It widened to a, uh, multiple lanes and the car didn't get confused. It was just trying to figure out where to center itself. But going back to the previous thing, like if I want to, I can um, like nudge it around like a pothole or something without completely disengaging the system. Some systems, if you try to swerve around something, it's like, oh, you're in control. And then you're a hundred percent in control of this. I could go like, Ooh, let me go around that. And then it'll adjust me back to the center gradually because it's handling the steering. And here's a case where the light's turning red. So I have to use the brakes to come to a stop because it does not recognize the, the stoplight. But, but yeah, I, you know, fairly competent um, system. I've re really been enjoying it when we've been on the I-5 and there's not so many stoplights. Um, fairly smooth on curves, handle, ha has handled the curves. There's some construction on I-5. Not, not anything serious like a bunch of cones in the road or anything like that, but they just sort of have lanes shifted over and there's some confusing, slightly confusing markings for some systems. This has been handling that uh, fine. Like it's, uh, I, I think if you, you know, have a daily commute where you're doing um, freeway driving back and forth, it would you know, really be nice to have the system here. Yeah, it's very, it's very comfy and plush. And when Patrick mentioned that it's quiet, it really is. It's actually like a noticeably quiet cabin. So we'll play some footage right now of us on that construction area, in that construction area, and what it sounded like. Even How though the, the, the pavement was grooved and had issues, it still was isolating a lot of that. Yeah, noticeable for us. So let's go. First time on the highway on the Lexus, in the Lexus RZ450E. Without our mics or anything, we just wanted to see, we the, testing to see how noisy it is. Turned off the uh, HVAC system, turned off the radio. The pavement's a bit grooved, so we're getting some hand noise, uh, road let's, noise from that. Let's show you guys, uh, this is nitty gritty selfie camera, nothing special because this way you can actually see what it's like. That's not bad. Yeah, what do you think? Okay, we know this road. Um, this is very construction-y. You can't really see that, but I'll show you again. It's very construction-y. It's not great. Um, and there's like grooves and stuff in the road, which I'm hearing that with the tires. Yeah. But I think just a little bit down the road, it'll be even quieter. We may test it out there as well. Yeah. So far, we're just doing a first drive. We're actually going to, uh, my mom just arrived in San Diego, so we're going to grab her and we weren't going to film anything but it is noticeably quiet so i give it a hopefully you can tell that that uh, at least to us being familiar with that road was noticeably quiet and um cushioned like silent cabin okay speaking of sounds that is one of the things that has bugged me about this vehicle <laughs> we'll, we'll try to get some highlights of that but even that it's like it's a very uh the sounds that it does use first of all remind me of like a 90s video game or something it's like boom, bong, bing um and it's also very alert happy which can be good or bad you know depending on 
how you drive. But, you know, for example, one that was bugging me is like every time like I'm in a double left turn lane and uh, we start going, I have my blinker on, I'm turning left because I'm in a double left turn lane. Well, it sees that there's a car in the lane next to me, obviously, and it, and it warns me. It's like beep, 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 beep or bong, 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 because it sees that car. And I'm like, yes, I know we're both making a left turn. It's okay. Um, another one that bugs me is like, if you come up to a stop sign on like a busy street and you're like, oh, I need to ed edge out a little bit so I can see a little bit further. Anytime you let off the brake and it sees that there's traffic coming, it makes audible tones. And I'm like, I, I get it. It's sort of nice to be warned that there's going to be, that there is some traffic there, but it it's, just weird to me like I know I, I just got to get out so I can see a little bit more so then it starts making noises I'm like and maybe this is an opinion thing so please share your opinion on if you think that it's appropriate for sounds to be heavy in that situation but another one that we'll play for you now is the backup sounds so it's only inside the vehicle although it did make a sound the other day and I tried to catch it but it stopped so so far, we only hear it inside the vehicle that when you go into reverse, gotta love technology. The GoPro just overheated, so hopefully we had everything. But the specific sound that I'm thinking of that most uh, weirds me out a bit. Before you get to that, let's just show some sounds. Oh yeah, oh this. <laughs> it's like, let me adjust the fan speed. Now, to be fair, there's got to be a way to disable it. We just haven't found it yet. So it I haven't be... looked for it, but I it just we try to experience it. This is what the default setting is. And this is very much like it's not a first drive because we've been driving it for a whole week, but it's definitely um, a first look at the Lexus RZ 450E. So there are those sounds and then the backup sounds, which we'll play for you, which I get making a couple of those sounds, but then it goes for the whole time that you're backing up and it's alerting you on the inside. So like, why do you need to be alerted that much on the inside that on the inside of the vehicle that you're backing up? Especially uh, like I selected the on the shifter to go into reverse. You did. The screen shifts into the reverse camera. Like I know that I'm backing up. Now, I do appreciate that because someone could do it by mistake, an animal could, a child could, um, but then like, like once you're... It's pretty... Uh, I don't know, actually. The, what do you think? What was that? What is happening? Because I was looking down. Oh, that's good. See, that's good. See, and that one was good because it <laughs> yeah. was important to let me know, like, hey, look up and pay attention to what you're doing. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. But we'll play the sounds for you and what it looks like now. Now, however, the backup camera and all of that stuff is awesome. I really like that. The 360 camera, I like that it's transparent. You know, it's yeah. not like a solid vehicle. Uh, it's it's quite cool. Oh, and you notice that it projects the road under the vehicle. So the cameras are getting the lower view. Yeah, it, it does some really good AI-ish type things, but it's really just using uh, camera history to show like what's underneath the car as you're moving and backing into a space pulling into a space so pretty neat um there be, before we end our driving segment and this goes back into the charging something that i did want to note um it doesn't show you the percentage of your battery which uh maybe that's not a big deal but every ev we've been in you can show percentage of battery this shows just like a, a normal gas gauge and it's just like with the gas car you know you have like that that vague of like well, it's not an eighth of a tank, but it's not a quarter of a tank. It's somewhere in between. It's the exact same way. There's an empty, there's a full, there's actually a, a gas pump icon at the halfway <laughs> mark, which I think is funny. But everything else is just like these little iterations that are little notches. And I could probably count and figure out what the percentage is. But uh, just from our EV driving experience, I want a percentage number. It does give me the range left and we're at about 
again, about 50%, maybe slightly higher. I'm not sure. But it says we have 85 miles of range, which just seems crazy. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, that it's 85 miles and we're about 50%. Yeah, but that's our driving impressions for this. Why don't we go park somewhere and give you guys our final thoughts? Well, that is it. That is our time in the Lexus RZ450E. What do you think about it, Patrick? Mixed. <laughs> uh, I don't think that we would buy this. There, there are some reasons why that I like it and I could see why people would buy it. Um, but I don't think it would suit us personally. It does have a lot of pros um, and a few cons. What is, what is your biggest pro on this one? I like driving it. I mean, on paper, I wouldn't buy it because it is too expensive to me for everything that you get. Driving it, it's really pleasant. It, it drives like an ice vehicle. It's not uh, too zippy, too powerful. It's not or, intimidating. It's not intimidating, yeah. Uh, just like the Bolt, it's really comfortable and unthreatening and unintimidating to drive. So driving style, I'd get in this and be like, ooh, this is great. What is this? I like this. Uh, knowing how much it costs, I wouldn't buy it. Which is, it costs about 65000 for the luxury trim level. Um, we actually don't have the window sticker. A lot of times we get the window sticker. We can tell you exactly what the price is and what features and options it has. We didn't get that on this car. So we're sort of it's about 65,000. Um, yeah, I think there are some big pros. Uh, I, I like some of the little um, like comfort features, the lumbar support, the nice materials. I love the, the sunroof that tents. I'm gonna do that again, just cause I think it's, it's cool. It's quite warm. Okay, we won't do that. Wow, but it's so actually, weird yeah, looking look, when look you at our do face. it. Like, yeah. Hey, there's sunlight. My hair is too bright there. I quite, I like this. It's actually a nice filming studio. Yeah. And I hate to say, like, it's hard to say we, like, if I say I wouldn't buy it, I'm not saying you shouldn't buy it. I'm saying that for yeah. for us or for me, um, I it's not the car for me, but I really like driving it. And if you are curious about it, I would encourage you to try it because it's a really enjoyable drive. So if the cost is not a factor, if the, the limited range isn't a factor, which... It yeah. really might not be. It, it reminds me of it's good. we were driving around the other night. Her mom was riding with this and I was like, ooh, uh, 130 miles of range. And for me, that was like a negative because it was still like 70% full or something like that. And in my mind, I'm like, ooh, it's only 130 miles of range. And her mom was like, wow, that's fantastic. 130 miles. And for her, she's never going to go on road trips or her boyfriend will will drive in his car uh she just won't drive on freeways she drives around town locally i think she does like maybe three thousand miles a year or something ridiculously low so for her 130 miles is plenty plenty far so it, it would be fantastic for somebody like her and it doesn't have to be an extreme case like that so um again like we we know people that they have one car that's ev that they use around town and then they have um, like a hybrid or a gas car bleh, that they, <laughs> they take on road trips. So there are a lot of use cases where this is nice. It feels like a Lexus. It feels, you know, it has uh, a lot of uh, nice features. Um, there's some quirkiness in like how you get in and out of CarPlay that bugged me a little bit. But otherwise, like, I think a lot of people would appreciate that. And that sort of goes back again. We were, uh, talking about that bugs me and her mom's like, what's CarPlay? I never, I never, connect my phone i don't want i don't want my phone connected to the car so if you don't like carplay then it's not an issue so there you know it's sort of like uh you know pretty much every car we review i like, go take it for a test drive see what you think yeah yeah honestly and i mean i this really does get a thumbs up in a lot of ways and um by the way when you said gas car blah, i did want to say if you're driving an old or a used gas vehicle, or if you do not have the economic situation or the housing situation, aka access to charging, mm -hmm. whatever, don't feel bad for driving a gas car. And please don't ever feel like we're trying to make you feel bad. They're fine. They're great. Uh, EVs are awesome, but they are uh, more expensive right now, even with tax incentives. So um, used cars are awesome too. I love used cars. So don't feel bad. Uh, this is a pricey, fancy, luxury, petite SUV. Would we say midsize? 
It, it's still small, compact crossover. I don't know. Compact. Crossover. I mean, there's going to be some smaller ones we hope coming out. But yes. It's, it's a uh, you know Ford Escape, Machi, Model Y. I mean, those are the competitors for this. And it feels it feels smaller than I think it is. It's really comfortable to drive. The suspension is great. The seats mm -hmm. are really comfortable. So you'll have to let us know what you think of the Lexus 450, the Lexus RZ 450e. That's a lot of things and stuff. Let us know what you think of it down below. Have you driven it? Uh, are you curious about it? Is there anything we missed? And <laughs> I'm curious, um, from our Colorado friends, they love the Solterra because they, you know, Colorado has a thing about Subarus. Um, I'm not sure anybody's excited by the BZ4X, but it's cheaper than this. So like which one of the three sort of like sister uh, EVs from the Toyota conglomerate do you like? Or do you cross them all off of your list? And, uh, you know, like as I was talking about the outside, you know, there's controversial things like the two-tone paint, all the black cladding, uh, just the weird angular nose on this one. Uh, we, you know, it's, it's always funny because it's like when I first saw it, I wasn't like, that's a great looking car. But the more I look at it, I'm like, it actually looks pretty neat. And I love the color combos on the outside and inside. And I think that's one of the things that um, sort of can distinguish like a well put together car is like how the materials are designed. And I know you appreciate like some of the stuff inside. Very much so. And I was trying to remember what the color is. Ether. It's on Ether, the, it's yeah. It's on the keys. Yeah, it, it looks really good. And I have to be honest, I wasn't expecting to like this car. Uh, definitely not as much as I did. Um, I'm automatically kind of put off by things when they're like unnecessarily expensive. So I begrudgingly say that I really like the drive, but it does make, he, make me curious to now drive the Solterra and the BZ4X because perhaps that will uh, be completely different or really similar in all the best ways and, and cheaper. Well, and so. then, so, and going back to like me looking at this, I start doing this and sometimes I go the wrong way. I go with start more and more expensive options. Like if I, like I want a, the iPhone 14, but I want the bigger one, but I want this camera. And then all of a sudden it's like, the biggest one with the most cameras on it. So with this one, I'm like looking at competitors and I'm thinking, well, this sort of reminds me of the Audi Q4 e-tron. So then I'm like, oh, well, I think I would go with the Q4 e-tron. But then if I look at the Q4 e-tron, I'm like, it's sort of just like a stepped up uh, ID4 and ID4 is a lot cheaper. So then I would look at that. And then of course the Tesla with the Model Y has done a lot of price cuts. So, it is significantly cheaper than this one if you don't mind you know the, the sparse cabin the lack of a driver screen the lack of car play and just some other things that that oops excuse me mm -hmm. that that may be eliminate tesla but it's sort of like you got to make those decision factors for yourself um and like the driver screen the lack of a driver screen some people don't see that as a negative at all for us we do for you it might not be a big deal but this obviously has a driver screen and a heads-up display and a 14-inch yeah. multimedia cluster. So it's it's really nice. Uh, surprisingly, <laughs> I enjoyed my time in this. Yeah, it's going to be like I pretty much regret always giving these back to to the uh, the manufacturer for even you know, the loan comes to an end um, because I, I do like checking out like all the different interiors. This one is like one of the nicer ones that we've been in. Yeah, and if you're curious, I think this would be an excellent complement to the Maki. -E. It doesn't feel quite equal to the Maki. -E. Uh, the Maki -E is more aggressively styled and playful looking. It has more range. It has, in our case, the GT Performance Edition it has more playfulness. Is your arm getting tired? <laughs> uh, I just sort of like <laughs> keep bouncing it, but anyways. Okay. So yeah, the Maki -E has more playfulness. So this is not a, a carbon copy. This is has a different space and a different place. Mm. And it certainly would feel like an excellent city car for us to have as a second vehicle. So if you're curious, I could see this being a good addition to the stable. Well, and that, and that sort of, you know, going back to the comparisons, it's like, uh, so the Maki -E GT Performance Edition, I forget the, what the price is now, because I know they just dropped the price. I think it's back down to 69. Oh, okay. It might be 68. So then if you're talking about like maybe $3,000 price difference and the Maki -E gets at least a partial credit. So then therefore this one, the Maki -E GT Performance Edition is about the same as this. It, I don't think there's any, yeah. It really depends on your preference though. Cause right. like if you don't care for the power, 
then why why is it worth it? Exactly. It's not worth it. And if you yeah. wanted a tinted <laughs> roof and a heads up display, why would you get the Mach E GT Performance Edition? But if you want zero to sixty in three point five seconds, you wouldn't get this. Yeah. So again, uh, I know that you may have tuned into this and you wanted like a yay or nay or you know our opinion. We gave you our thoughts, but it's really still up to you. You're going to make the car payment on it, so. Yeah, do you want to yay on it? I don't know. Probably not. I don't know. I what think do people want? like confirmation that they're making the right choice. That's so hard, isn't it? I mean, that's why these are like some of the biggest purchases in our lives. So that's part of why we love sharing this stuff is that we get to like dig into just like whether it's worth it, which is so hard, which is why we talk too much. So on that yeah. note, we should stop talking. <laughs> Before I drop the camera. <laughs> Before he drops the camera. Thank you so much for joining us for this video in which we checked out the Lexus RZ450e and spent a lovely week with it. Let us know what you think about it down below. And if there's any other vehicle that you would like us to check out, a huge thank you to our patrons whose names are scrolling across the screen. Thanks to you, we'd be able to do things like get this tripod thing that Patrick is holding. It's actually kind of cool looking. Um, and he filmed some of the stuff outside because my leg is sore. So yay, thank you very much for letting <laughs> me sit down and, and make him do all the work. <laughs> Um, and on that note, just remember that whatever you drive, whether you can tint the roof I with a press of a button or not, <laughs> enjoy the ride. Bye. Bye. Wouldn't it be cool if we could like press the button and it goes. Choo.